please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Overdrive is celebrating its 20th anniversary, which means we are now supposed to be out of our teens, supposed to be more sensible. So this month, we are not going to do our usual two, three, four car shoots. We have 20 of them. The body style, the most preferred one, SUVs. But to get 20 SUVs in one space, you need a big expanse. You need good or bad roads, good conditions, good weather to drive them around. So we said please to our friends from Chikmagalur, who also happen to be big coffee barons. They go by the name of Coffee Day. I'm sure you've heard of them. They're also automobile enthusiasts, so they gladly opened their doors to their big coffee plantations. And then the cars got happy. They thought it's a big anniversary celebration that's happening. So they didn't come alone. They got a few of their friends along. So now we have more than 20 SUVs. But what happens when you have such good SUVs that come together on such slushy terrain, you have such beautiful trails, fun supposed to be had, right? It can't be a sensible story anymore, or it can be. We also have a rally driver in the mix who's going to add the fun aspect, but it is more play, less work, but we are putting it all together. We are doing a lot of sensible things. We are putting together a lot of sensible parameters too, to bring out not the best car in the test, not the best SUV of the test, but to highlight the best of every car. Take a look. SUVs are the most preferred body style in the automobile world, and it's no mystery why. Be it a people carrier, a load lugger, or a mile muncher, SUVs are perceived to be the do-it-all vehicle. We like them on tarmac just as much as we like them to be all-terrain friendly, and that is where we face a slight dilemma. So we gauged our party of SUVs on various parameters to highlight the ability of each one of them. Our original list of SUVs was pretty long, but some of them dropped out along the way owing to the time and the logistical constraints. Now coming to the parameters. Since SUVs are almost always expected to look imposing, we have keenly looked at this aspect when evaluating the design. In the cabin, we have investigated the ease of ingress and egress, the visibility for all the passengers, the efficiency of the wipers, the practicality of the cabin elements and storage spaces, and the ease of access of the boot area and the spare wheel. Gathering our enormous road test data, we have also gauged the touring capabilities of each SUV. SUVs are almost always expected to perform with zest even off the blacktop. So to that effect, we have also looked into various sub-parameters like the drivetrain, the off-roading aids and the dimensions. We are hosting the SUV Slugfest at one of the Coffee Day India Rally of Chikmagalur stages, which also hosts a round of the Asia-Pacific Rally Championship or APRC. We manned the stage timings on a distinctive 2.3 km long dirt stage created specially for this OD SUV special slugfest. We chose to call it the Cicada stage, simply because the entire stretch was full of cicadas, a large insect with long transparent wings, found primarily in warm countries like ours. Unlike uh, what you have in Australia and New Zealand, which is basic, generally flat out terrain, this is this is a real uh, challenge. It's a little demanding, and uh, we have uh, the we have a variety here. This uh, place where we are standing is the uh, last stage of the uh, APRC. Gaurav Gil, for, for example, named it the Rally of Thousand Corners. It is challenging because it's. Uh, 75% of the terrain is very, very twisty. And you have corners after corner, corner after corner. And some of them are very, very uh, tight. Vikram Narendra, the now retired gentleman rallyist and the 1991 Group N category Indian National Rally Champion, was our official stage driver. The handling and balance, steering response and accuracy, the vehicle's ability to put the power down smoothly and without losing traction, braking, the centre of gravity, body roll, size and weight and of course the grip levels offered by the tyres were all on trial in this exceptionally difficult test. Five, four, three, 
two, one, go! That said, the stage times provide just a partial but a particularly perceptive picture of the 360 degree view of our slugfest and is in the primary parameter to judge the SUVs. We divided the 25 SUVs into 5 categories and for some of the most popular entry spec cars, JK Tires was kind enough to provide some fresh rubber from their Ranger and the UX Royale lineup of tires, both of which are road biased but optimized to take on broken and rough roads that these cars will frequently encounter in India. The tires are impressive even in the slushy conditions, but more on that later. Welcome back to the Overdrive Slugfest. We begin with the entry level category, and the first up is the handsome and the novel Tata Nexon. For a sub 4 meter SUV, the Nexon is wide, and while its street presence may not be all that imposing, it attracts its share of eyeballs. The visibility isn't the best with a broad A pillar up front and a narrow windscreen at the back. In terms of practicality, the Nexon could have done with better storage spaces in the cabin. It has a fairly large boot though, and we like some of the nifty features like the umbrellas in the front doors. The high speed stability is quite good too, and though the 44 litre tank capacity is the least in this segment, the tall 6 gear ensures that it has a good fuel economy and a decent touring range of about 750 kilometers. Now, talking about off road performance, the Nexon has again impressed us. It really managed to feel good even in the slushiest of terrain. And being a front wheel drive car, it did handle well, went through the slush, went through ruts well, and of course, the ground clearance does help too. I loved it. Brilliant car. It was like a little rally car. Very, very good in the slush, very good in the, in the tight twisties section, behaved very, very well. That compact size and proportions encourage you to fling it around, making it quite fun to drive. But the Nexon does move around a lot, and as a result of the constant corrections required, it was the second slowest in this test. The Maruti Suzuki Vitara Brezza is leading the charge for the compact crossovers out there. Now, it has the proportions of a classic SUV, it doesn't have the size of an SUV, and that is what makes sure that it doesn't look very imposing. But then it's a compact crossover and it's got a very handsome design, a very pleasing wipe to it. And that is what works in its favour. The Brezza has a decent glasshouse area, provides good visibility and has a large wiper sweep area as well. Now with compact crossovers, ingress and egress can become a problem. With this car, it's not that big an issue. The front door opening is quite wide, the height is quite good, so in and out is not a problem. However, at the rear, things get a little cramped purely because of this wheel arch which sort of comes in your way when you're getting in and out. Rear seat space is excellent for a vehicle of this size but the cargo space at 328 litres is limited and the parcel tray and its mounts are somewhat flimsy and rattle during off-road driving. It's a capable highway cruiser and has a decent 800 km driving range. It's very easy to throw around and correct due to its well-tuned driving dynamics and a reasonably communicative steering. The manual mode on the AGS delivered better control over the drivetrain and all these combined helped the Brezza reach the 12th spot on the timesheets. The EcoSport kicked off the compact SUV trend and despite the polarizing grille, it looks quite imposing. The tailgate mounted spare wheel is a design highlight and also makes the step knee easy to access. The wiper efficiency could have been better and the sharply sloped A pillars obstruct peripheral view and vision while going around turns. Due to the smallish door openings, ingress and egress is a little tight but the seating and the edge point is good. There are ample storage spaces in the cabin but no grab handles to hold on to when the going gets rough thanks to the airbag mechanism. 1.5 litre diesel has a reasonable cruising range of about 725 kilometers. The engine is peppy and punchy, and the gear shifter is precise and pleasure to use. But high speed stability could have been a bit better. The EcoSport has a decent ground clearance, and the overhangs are not too long. But it's a front wheel driven car like most other cars in the segment, and it's a little too front biased in terms of its weight distribution, which makes it a little tricky when you're tackling the car on slush or slightly uh, more slippery surface. There's a lot of understeer. 
if you really want to take this off the road, you will need better tyres, something that's more off-road biased in that sense. Now the Rangers from JK did work quite well for the other cars from this segment and it could work well for the EcoSport too. But like I said, if you want to take it off the road, you're going to need more off-road focused tyres. With that understeery behaviour in the slush and unpredictable braking, the EcoSport stage timings were quite honestly disappointing. Though the design of the Duster is getting long in the tooth now, it still looks quite imposing and unique. The wiper efficiency is pretty average and the A-pillar extends into the door frame on which the door mirrors are mounted and this obstructs the cornering vision. The Ingress and Egress is alright at the front but tight at the rear given the low roof. Storage space in the cabin is limited though but the boot space is very good, albeit cumbersome to access. If you want to start off with a little bit of off-roading, a bit of trail driving and you don't want something as hardcore as a Thar or a Gurkha, you want something that's a little more stylish, a little more comfortable, then the Duster AWD could be a good starting point. You have short overhangs on the front and the back, the ground clearance is good, and the AWD also comes with a decent capability off the road. You can keep it in two-wheel drive, so fuel economy is not a problem, you can lock it in uh, all-wheel drive if you want to go off the road, if you want to hit the slush, or you can just leave it in auto and the car will decide on its own what's the best kind of drivetrain for a particular terrain. It's not a terrain response system, it's not a terrain mode of any kind, but overall the dynamics of this car on the road and off it are really good. Phenomenal car to drive. I think the four-wheel drive is a, is a brilliant car. It's really good, especially in the slush, in the slippery condition. It just held on to, to the road. It just see. The front end was just... I mean, uh, four-wheel drive was working very well. The braking was outstanding. Could come into a, co a corner, stand on the brake and, and it never drift left or right. Uh, okay. Stayed in place. It's not a big surprise that the duster was actually right at the top of the charts for a long time when we did our timing runs with these SUVs. And also contributing to the fact are the JK Ranger ST tyres that uh, we put on this car. Uh, they're not completely road biased. There is, if you look at the tread pattern, there is a bit of knobby pattern right at the centre which also helps it in the slush, which also helps it when the terrain gets a little sticky, a little slippery. It really worked in the Duster's favour. The Duster is light on its feet and its agile handling allows you to confidently fling it into corners and even under hard braking, it is predictable and remains largely true to its line. The timing show that though the Duster may not have many frills, it sure can boast of well-sorted driving dynamics and admirable engineering and performance. The Terrano is the Duster's Japanese cousin and apart from a few visual differentiators inside and out, most of the practicality and visibility parameters remain the same. It differs in its all-terrain capability with a slightly lower ground clearance of 205mm and the absence of an AWD option in the lineup. Which also means that in challenging weather or terrain, it isn't as capable as the Duster. And this sheer difference put a 10-car gap between the Duster and the Terrano on the stage timings. Though a common sight now, the Creta stylish exterior works and its typical SUV proportions find it plenty of takers. The overhangs are tiny, but the 190mm of ground clearance could have been better, especially when the road gets really rough. The front seat visibility is one of the best in the test and so is the wiper efficiency, cleaning the glass all the way to the top. Rear seat visibility is compromised due to the rising belt line. The cabin also has adequate storage spaces and is complemented by a large and a flat boot space. The wide tailgate opening and the low loading lip make it convenient to load luggage and access the spare wheel too. Out on the highway and in the city, the Creta impresses with its good high-speed stability, a slick powertrain and a decent efficiency which gives it a massive 950km of cruising range. The Hyundai Creta astonishingly finished second fastest in our special stage and that is primarily because it is well balanced and handles beautifully in the loose. Whatever the surface, the Creta connects well with it and manages to convey a high amount of confidence to the driver. What's even better is that it's really entertaining to drive and rewards one with its willing and eager performance. We start now with the premium SUVs and we start with the Hexa. Now there's no denying that the Hexa is still an MPV underneath. Notice that the moment you see the enormous size. 
but you have to give it to Tata. The kind of design elements that they've added to this to give it that SUV and that good stance, it really works. This has to be the most comprehensive facelift that we've seen on a car ever. Ingress and egress is easy, but you have to climb up to the lofty seats. The bulky A-pillars restrict cornering visibility and the wiper efficiency isn't very good. Storage space in the cabin is really limited and access to the jack and the toolkit is quite cumbersome. Despite a below par touring range of 700 km, a good high speed stability and a supple ride comfort make this car a decent tourer. Our automatic test car did not have all wheel drive and then there was the heft of the hexa which became quite handful on the slush and that reflects in its stage timings. It had a lot of power, I think there was a lot of torque, of course it, uh, it was uh, sideways most often but uh, not by the car. XUV, the other homegrown SUV of this category, has a massive fan following thanks to its imposing stance. The cabin is a bit of a hit and miss though, with the thick A-pillars obstructing corning visibility, but the low dash ensuring a commanding view of the road. Ingress and egress is easy at the front, but cumbersome at the back with the high seating. On the off-roading front though, the XUV has adequate ground clearance and is available with a lockable all-wheel drive. The diesel engine is reasonably powerful and cruising range is an impressive 980 km but with a full load you do need a push to overtake. Braking does not inspire a lot of confidence but off the road the XUV performs quite well as a package. Thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, superb drive, I felt more comfortable because you're right on top when you, you can see everything and uh, uh, in total command of the way. It was in a straight line at all times, two and a half kilometers straight line, never went sideways, so able to hold the car also very well, never went off once, especially in the tank bun, never went sideways, it, it, it just went up straight. The compass is compact and smart and the iconic Jeep grille gives it an imposing stance. The compass has possibly the thickest A-pillars of this test, which intrudes in the peripheral vision. The wiper sweep is average, the front visibility is clear though. The doors open wide and the low seat makes ingress and egress quite convenient. We particularly love the heavy-duty floor mats for off-road use. While the heavy clutch can get cumbersome on long-distance journeys, the diesel engine is peppy with a good low and mid-range torque. The touring range is about 950 km. The braking is reassuring and the FSD suspension provides a comfortable and composed ride. When we talk about off-roading, the compass is a bit of a mixed bag. The ground clearance is decent, the overhangs are short, there's limited underbody protection. You can buy the all-wheel drive version only in diesel and only with a manual transmission. There's no option of an automatic. But when you talk about off-roading with the package that's available, this compass is impressive. It's an all-wheel drive but gives you a four-wheel drive lock or an all-wheel drive lock. It also gives you different terrain modes to drive on different kinds of loose surfaces. The way it performs on all of them, the way it plows through everything and the kind of power it puts down. Impressive. Too good. The terrain management system works quite well, changing the throttle response and power delivery to suit the terrain and the driving environment. Despite this, the power delivery could have been much smoother and could have resulted in a faster time if power did not come surging past the 2000 RPM mark. The Endeavour has the textbook old-school styling for SUVs and that gives it an imposing stance quite unlike any other. Making use of many grab handles, you climb into the tall cabin where you get a commanding view of the road. Cornering visibility is restricted and wiper efficiency is average. The cabin elements, storage spaces and spare wheel are all convenient to use though. Though its largest in-class 3.2-litre engine has moderate fuel economy, this able highway cruiser has a range of 920 kilometers. When it comes to going off-road, this big American is extremely impressive and despite the size and heft, it managed to really do well in the mud, slush and any condition that it was put to. Lots of reasons for that, one of the main ones being the terrain selector that lets you choose the kind of terrain you would be driving on, which in our case is mud and slush and it performed very, very well. Also another reason behind that is the fact that it gets a four-wheel drive lock and a low ratio as well. 
The only fly in the ointment here though is the fact that Ford does not sell the Endeavour with a manual gearbox at all. The Ford Endeavour grips the ground and transfers power quite effectively even in slush. Its handling is also predictable, but its large size and the weight means it cannot be thrown around impulsively. Despite this, the stage timing is quite respectable. The Fortuner is one of the most aspired for vehicles in India and in its new avatar, it's transformed from a butch SUV to a stylish, sophisticated one. The elevated seating imparts a commanding view even with the high set dash. The A pillars do restrict peripheral view, but the long windows compensate somewhat. The wiper sweep coverage could have been better. Ingress and egress is quite convenient, but headroom at the rear is compromised. Talking of touring capabilities, it's hard not to compare this car to its sibling, the Toyota Innova, purely in terms of the storage spaces and the sheer number of bottle holders that it has. This one doesn't have so many, but there's adequate space for all the occupants. The main factor is the massive tank. It gives you a range of over 1,000 kilometers. Pair that with the dynamics that this car has and adventure touring or long distance touring becomes quite fun. The Fortuner is quite serious on its off-road intent as well. You get hill descent control, you get hill hold, you get excellent ground clearance, even better approach and departure angles. You have a lot of protection for the engine and the axles as well. It doesn't get a terrain select system or a terrain mode system. However, it does get a low-range gearbox to crawl out of tricky situations and spec it up with the right set of tyres. And it's an absolute fun to drive machine, no matter what the terrain. I said the exteriors, they don't look good when they're dirty, but that doesn't mean that the Fortuner doesn't like to get dirty. It does. The Fortuner feels quite planted in the loose and responds eagerly to driver inputs, but it is not athletic and one is always conscious of its considerable size and weight. But despite this, its stage timing is commendable. The Tiguan isn't imposing, but has a clean and understated elegance. Its compact dimensions make it ideal for our conditions, but the cabin is quite spacious and functional. The wipers are very effective, but the high dash gets in the way of the frontal view. The ingress and egress is excellent, but you sit somewhat low. Spare wheel storage is sensible and one of the best and easiest to reach. The Tiguan also comes with two practical foldable wheel chocks. This is rare and something not found in most vehicles. The ground clearance is modest, however, the Tiguan has an all-wheel drive system that is closely integrated with the anti-lock braking, electronic stability and traction control systems and the throttle response and gear shift points. It also has hill assist and hill descent control. A lovely car, it felt more car-like. Didn't kind of feel the SUV presence. It, it, it performed very well on the in the slash. Felt extremely ca capable. It was very quick, very uh, talky engine. Suspension was brilliant. Four wheel drive worked very well. Uh, braking was very good. Excellent car. The Škoda Kodiak is like the perfect gentleman. It does everything expected of it and more. It has an elegant profile, while the edgy design looks quite remarkable. The cabin is inviting and the relatively slim A-pillars afford a nice view. The wiper sweep is extensive and along with the diffused washer spray, cleans a large portion of the windscreen. Ingress and egress is easy thanks to the white doors and they also come with a door edge protector that automatically emerges and covers the edges when the doors are opened. The Kodiak is big on such features and has more functional storage spaces than you can probably use. Both the front doors have umbrellas in them a rechargeable LED light illuminates the boot and can be removed and used as a flashlight. The headlight washers are effective and overall space management and ease of storage is splendid. The engine is moderately powerful with the least torque in this segment and it has to be pushed hard to make speedy progress which tells on the fuel efficiency. Range is between 750 to 800 kilometers. The ground clearance is the least in the segment too but it has an automatic all-wheel drive with a snow mode. Interestingly, there's an electronic differential lock which works superbly and handles so well in the loose that it almost feels like a sports car. Pleasantly sir, surprised. I thought, I thought when I stepped into it, it was a long, very long car and I thought it'll get 
get out of shape very very soon but it didn't it, it was in lots of composure very very, very quick yeah. very good car control very good car control never never get, got bogged down in the slush it was a superb uh, suv so this is the midway point then we are done with the compact the entry level cars we are done with the premium cars this is where it ends for this week the biggies are yet to come the luxury cars the hardcore ones which happens next week thank you so much for watching this is it for chikmagaluru this week stay tuned for next week show